Well, this is normally when we take the offering, but uh, today, instead of passing the offering plate, we have got offering baskets as you exit. They'll be there waiting for you. You can drop your tithe and offering in the basket when you leave. And of course, those of you at home, um, if you're in the home groups, I think they'll take the offering there. And if you're watching, there'll be some uh, information on the screen about how to give electronically. Um, but anyway, let me, before we get into the message, I have just a few comments to make, and then we'll get into the sermon. But we're obviously having church, but we're having it in many different locations. And it's a reminder that church isn't a building, of course. It's not even a certain meeting. The church is the living uh, it, the church is a living body filled with the Spirit of God and held together by faith and love. And I want to tell you, those of you who are meeting in your home groups, uh, give a special thanks to those who are hosting. Uh, they host you every week, and now they're open their house up again on Sunday. And be sure you thank them for that. Uh, now, unless you're Rip Van Winkle and you just... Woke up from a very, very long winter's nap. Uh, you know that the coronavirus news has been all over the news. <clears throat> and uh, some people, you talk to people, and some people are saying, well, it's being blown way out of proportion. Other people on the other side are saying it's worse than anybody thinks. And then everybody else is somewhere in the middle. So a lot of opinions. But what do we know for sure? Let me just point out two things that we know for sure. Number one. We know that like all flu viruses, this one is quite contagious. And the second thing that we know is that for certain populations, like those with respiratory disease or those who are elderly or some people with other underlying uh, physical health concerns, that this can be a very dangerous virus. So the great majority of people, if you were to catch this virus, it would seem to you like any other flu virus. Uh, it doesn't seem to be any worse. A lot of times people say that, uh, that the uh, symptoms they get are quite mild. So the reason that you are all being asked to be so careful and make sacrifices, it's not because of self-preservation. The average person does not have to be afraid that they're going to get very, very sick. The reason that we're being asked to take these precautions and the reason that we're going to do it is as an act of love to those people who would really, really be at risk. <clears throat> now, you may know this already, that every year, according to the uh, Center for Disease Control, 36,000 people die on average every year from the flu. Now, not so much from the flu, but usually from complications like pneumonia. And with the uh, coronavirus, it has the potential for even much greater death because the uh, pneumonia that's associated with it is a much more deadly type. So now, like any church, our church family also has people that are in these uh, high you know, danger uh, populations. We have elderly, we have people with respiratory problems. You know, I think about uh, my grandson, Neil's son, right in, and he's one that were he to get this virus, it would be very, very serious. So all of us in our lives are being inconvenienced. Some people very severely, some people have already lost their jobs, and it's hard. But all of us to one degree or another are being inconvenienced. However, we need to think of it as an act of love, that uh, we are loving those people that are most vulnerable. So let's talk a little bit about what should we do as individuals, and probably you're all familiar with this, but basically we should do the same things that we normally do, start up there during flu season. The first thing is you should wash your hands regularly throughout the day. They say to do it uh, uh, for 20 seconds, and it seems very simple. But simply washing your hands is very, very effective in defeating this device, this uh, virus. You wash, it, you wash your hands and it goes down the sink. And you need to remember that <clears throat> viruses can last on hard surfaces like doorknobs or uh, you know, uh, tabletops or something for hours. So it's important, if you can, to wash your hands. Once again, 
It's not because you necessarily have really something to fear, not if you're healthy. But if you get this disease, even if you don't get that sick, you pass it along, and eventually it could get to somebody to whom it could really be uh, life-threatening. And then our hospitals are overtaxed. So it's really important that we do this. Uh, the, number, the second thing is what's being called social distance. Social distance. And so that means, what does that mean? They're asking you to try and keep six feet distance. So if you're going to sit on a trolley, if you're going to go to a movie theater, if you're going to go to a restaurant or any situation like that, if you can try and locate yourself six feet. Now, obviously, you're with your husband or wife or with your family, but from other people, six feet. Now, it's interesting. Why is that? The number one way that this virus is <clears throat> transmitted isn't through doorknobs or, or tabletops. It's primarily through people coughing. And the virus is in the droplets uh, of water when a person coughs. Now, here's the good news. You're not in any danger just because somebody's coughing in a room or even that somebody's coughing next to you. They have to be directly in front of you. So the cough goes out straight, and the droplets, even from like a strong cough or somebody that really has big lungs and lets it go, those droplets all drop to the ground within six feet. So in order for you to be in trouble, somebody has to cough right at you, and you have to be closer than six feet. So the idea of keeping six feet distance when you're going, like right now, you're pretty much all at six foot distance for the most part. The reason for doing that is so if somebody coughs, the droplets can't reach you. Uh, what else? Well, just common courtesy during flu seasons, things like uh, cover your mouth when you cough. If you think you're getting sick, don't go to work, stay home. Just common things that we should do all the time. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, we should probably avoid handshakes and even fist bumps until we're through this crisis or this challenge. It feels like a crisis. Now, I want you all to think about this. <clears throat> During this time, we have an excellent opportunity to minister to other people. An excellent opportunity to demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of people that are really afraid right now. And, uh, you know, they're hiding, they're at home hiding behind all their toilet paper. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> they, they're not quite sure what to think. And you can reach out to people like that, and you can pray with them. Do you know, I've always found that people that are under stress, even if they never go to church, even if they say they're not religious, they almost always want you to pray with them or for them. And so we can just show by our faith and our confidence and our love uh, the peace that Jesus brings to a soul. So I'll be talking a little bit more in the message about ways that we'll be able to serve during this. Now, nobody knows how long this whole period is going to last. We hope it's not going to last very long. Uh, viruses die. If we don't pass it on, it'll die out. So let's hope it's not for an extended period of time. And it's a rapidly developing situation. How many know everything changed for us Thursday afternoon? <laughs> Up until Thursday afternoon, it was just, you know, life is normal for us here at Foothills. So everything's changing. We'll be meeting this next week. We'll be reevaluating where things are, what to do going forward. And uh, we'll certainly let you guys know on our online, social media, things like that. But I want to close this little opening with some really good news. How many of you heard that President Trump... Uh, declared today, this Sunday, as a national day of prayer. Is that a blessing? <clears throat> I'm so blessed that throughout our history, and even to this day, we have national leaders who remember that we are one nation under God and turn us again to look to the one in whom is our confidence. And uh, so I want to read to you, if you haven't seen it already, <clears throat> the declaration he made. He said, it is my great honor to declare Sunday, March 15th, as a national day of prayer. <clears throat> we are a nation that throughout our history has looked to God for protection and strength in time like these. No matter where you may be, I urge you to turn to prayer as an act of faith. So we're going to do that. We're going to just join in and, and say a prayer right now together. Those of you at home, those of you at the home groups, and 
those of us in the sanctuary, would you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we rejoice in our national motto that we are one nation under God. And we remember again that our hope and our confidence is only in you. And that, Lord, you change the times and the seasons. And so, Lord, we want to just pray that you would awaken hunger in this heart, in uh, this nation for you during this time. And that hearts would turn towards you. Lord, we want to pray for uh, those that are making decisions in our cities, in our state, and in our nation concerning what to do at this time. We pray you would give them great insight and understanding. Lord, you know the end from the beginning. And that you would guide them, Lord, in making right choices. Lord, so that this virus might be uh, eliminated from our nation. Lord, we pray for those in the healthcare profession, Lord, who might be, uh, Lord, especially burdened. We pray for doctors and nurses. We pray they would have your strength and your patience. We pray for our president and our Congress that they would make wise decisions as well. Lord, we pray for those that are elderly that are right now maybe fighting this disease. We pray that you rescue them. We pray that you pull our nation together during this time. Not only that we would find each other, but that many people would turn their eyes towards you because, Lord, you are the only unifier that can draw people together from all backgrounds and opinions. And so we pray for that, Lord. We pray for those that have already lost their jobs. And we pray for those whose businesses are being tremendously impacted. We pray you be their help. We pray, Lord, you bring help to them from, uh, Lord, every area. We pray for the church, Lord. We pray that your church would rise up in the Spirit of God and that we would be the light of the world, the Lord, that we would do the acts of mercy, that this would be a fine hour for your church. Lord, we thank you that we have a confidence and that we are not shaken. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. I hope uh, anybody that has a full cabinet full of toilet paper didn't take any offense at my comment. All right. Are you ready for the sermon? <clears throat> And you're thinking, man, I felt like we already had it. <laughs> no, good news, bad news. Bad news, there's another sermon. <laughs> good news, it's kind of a short one. All righty? So here's what I want to talk about <clears throat> this morning. I want to talk about following Jesus. As a matter of fact, that's the title of the sermon. And let me ask you a question. Do you want to follow Jesus? Do you really want to know him? Do you want to become like him? Do you want to walk in his footsteps? If you do, I've got a verse for us. It's something Jesus said about himself, and it's an important for us to know as we think about following Jesus. Luke 22, 27. <clears throat> Jesus said, For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Jesus defined himself by service. His whole life was marked by serving others. He said, I am among you as one who serves. Although he was the Lord of Lords, how many know he was? Although he was the King of glory, how many know he's the King of glory? Yet he expressed that dignity and that power by serving other people. Serving was his life purpose. Serving was the motivation to what he did. And speaking of himself, he said this, Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Now this morning, if you want to be like Jesus, I want you to say this. You can say it silently. But if you want to be like Jesus, I want you to say... I did not come to be served, but to serve. It's a different way of thinking about your life. I am not here to be served, but to serve. <clears throat> now, lots of people want to do what Jesus did. You hear that talk all the time. Be, 
Do what Jesus did. And a lot of people want to do it if it's something really exciting like healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead, <clears throat> preaching to great crowds. But I want to tell you, Jesus said, I am among you as one who serves. And that is something that every one of us can do. How many know every one of us can be like Jesus and we can serve? Now, people aren't that crazy about serving as a rule. I mean, when people get the opportunity to serve in some way, most people's flesh doesn't go, yippee. Most people, <clears throat> the first reaction is to look around to see if someone else will do it. Reminds me of a story. Uh, this man became very, very sick, and as he got sicker, he became very weak until he could hardly leave his bed. So his wife took him to the doctor, <clears throat> and the doctor examined him and did a number of tests, and then called them at their house three or four days later to tell them the test. And the wife answered the phone, and the doctor says, I have those test results, and I've got some good news for you. Although your husband is very, very sick and very, very weak, he can recover. But here's what you need to do. You need to wait on him hand and foot. You need to not make him do anything that you could do for him. You need to cook him a very special diet. <clears throat> you need to feed him four times a day. You need to give him a sponge bath. You need to think of yourself as being at his beck and call 24 hours a day. And then the doctor said, do you understand that if you do these things, he will recover? She said, yes, I understand. She hung up the phone. The husband called from the other room. What did the doctor say? She said, the doctor said you're going to die. <laughs> now, that's how most people feel about being called on to serve. When um, my father, in the last year of his life, he declined. He had a series of strokes over a period of five years. And then he went into a pretty serious dementia to the fact that uh, the last two, two and a half years of his life, he was bedridden and he could no longer recognize us. And then he got to the point where he wasn't even responsive in any way. And as I watched my mother care and serve my father over those years, every day, I recognized that I was watching a manifestation of the Spirit of Jesus, that she was being like Jesus and she was being empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, like Jesus, my mother also defined her whole life as serving other people, and she did it up to her very end. My mother had a very close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and I believe this is one of the big reasons why. The secret to fellowship with Jesus is to, and becoming like him is this, to go beyond believing the right things and to go beyond that and to start living the way that he lived, following his footsteps, having his priorities. You've perhaps heard me say this before, and that is that a lot of people are content to settle for being religious rather than to press on and become truly spiritual. It's easy to content yourself with doing religious things rather than becoming spiritual. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me put it on the, on the bulletin on the screen. Being religious means this. Holding certain beliefs and conforming to certain standards of behavior. So there's a set of doctrines you need to believe, and then there's a set of rules that you have to not break. Don't drink, don't chew, don't go out with girls who do. That was <laughs> an early one. Now, that's being religious. But being spiritual means following Jesus' example, empowered by the Holy Spirit until his power and love transform your life. Can you see the difference between simply believing the right things and following the right rules and actually following Jesus, his example, all the while relying on the Holy Spirit. And in that process, the Spirit of God transforms and changes you. Some people don't seem to change much. Have you ever noticed that? And it's, real, it's true for Christians. Because you see, I have watched Christians over the years, even over the decades, seemingly go through the same things over and over 
again. They just have the same problems. They go through the same conflicts. They stumble over the same things. And it reminds me a little bit of that great movie, uh, Groundhog Day. Remember that day? Bill Murray, every day, woke up and lived the same day over and over and over again until, until he learned his lesson and changed. And on the next morning after that happened, he woke up and it was a brand new day. Now, it's the same thing with us. Our lives will not be transformed until we stop doing it our way and start doing it Jesus' way and walk in his footsteps. And Jesus was a servant. He said, I am among you as one who serves. And so we'll never be transformed and become like him and know the freedom and the joy that he had until we also are willing to serve. You know, there are so many opportunities to serve in life. All of us have a lot of opportunities. Starts with our family, our coworkers, our neighbors, but certainly a lot of opportunities to serve people in the church. And then uh, to serve people through a lot of our outreaches, through people you don't even know, people in the community. And can I say that <clears throat> I am so proud of this church. This church is filled with servants. Any pastor in America would be thrilled to serve this church. Our whole staff counts ourselves so lucky to serve a church that gets it so much about volunteering and helping and serving and reaching out to their neighbors and loving on people. Now, Jesus was the greatest servant that ever lived. He served more people than anyone else. He humbled himself more because he went from the highest high and went all the way down to dying on the most shameless death, which is nailed to the cross like a common criminal. He paid the highest price. Jesus understood the joy and the power of serving. Now, many people put themselves first in whatever they do. How many know that? Many people always put themselves first with the idea being that they're going to make themselves happy. But what they find out is that happiness that way is elusive. It keeps slipping through your fingers. They can't seem to hold on to it. But when you serve people, then you are blessed. And being blessed is much better than being happy because happiness is dependent upon situations that can change. It means everything has to line up right. People have to treat you right. Things are always changing. But blessedness is the favor of God resting on your life. And that never changes. No matter what the circumstances, no matter what people are doing, nobody can take the favor off your life. So the, to be blessed is much better than being happy. People who are blessed will generally be happy. So it's better to be blessed. Now I want to talk about, oh, let me say this. The people I know with the most joy all have one thing in common. They've learned about serving, and they serve. Now, let's talk about the, what I believe are the three biggest reasons that we don't serve, the three biggest obstacles to our serving. If you will, the three kind of like excuses we give to ourselves of why we can't serve. I'll give them to you real quick. Number one, we say, I've got my own problems to worry about. How can I think about somebody else's problems when I've got problems? Number two, you ever said this? You ever thought this? They don't deserve my help. They're in the situation they are 100% of because decisions they made, and if we help them, they'll probably just blow it again anyway. And number three, I'm too busy. I have more important things to attend to. Now, I believe these are three great obstacles that keep people from serving. Three things that we tell ourselves. You know, there's a snapshot of Jesus in the New Testament, John 13, where he faced all three of these obstacles. He had all three of these excuses. It's in the story where Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And so I want us to turn there and see how did Jesus deal with these three issues the first one being, I've got problems of my own. The second one being, they don't deserve it. And the third one being, um, 
I'm too busy. I've got more important things to do. So let's go there. And let's just put yourself in mind of Jesus. Think about that night what he might have been thinking about, what might have been on his mind. Well, there were three things I know that were on Jesus' mind, three things he knew that night before he washed the disciples' feet. Here's the first thing that he knew. He knew that he was about to die a terrible death. John 13, first half of verse 1, says this. Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, and that he was about to depart out of the world. Now, Jesus knew exactly what that meant when it said he was going to depart out of the world, that his hour had come. Here's what he knew. He knew within a very short period, that very evening, he would be arrested. He would be falsely charged. He would be beaten. Then he'd be taken to Pilate's, where he would be uh, you know, beaten and whipped and a crown of thorns would be posted on his head. And then <clears throat> he would be taken out and he would be crucified, nailed to a cross. And he would die a horrible and painful death while people mocked him. You see, he had a lot on his mind that night. You ever had someone come up to you and want you to help him and you say, sorry, it's not a good time for me. I'm not having a good day. Jesus could have said that. In spades. He had a lot on his mind. It can be hard to serve other people when you have troubles of your own. You can say, I've got my own problems to worry about. How can I be expected to help others? But the truth is, you will experience the fellowship and the strengthening and the encouragement of the Lord Jesus Christ when you serve others despite the fact you have your own problems. As a matter of fact, by serving others, you can be lifted above your own problems, above your own frustrations, and you can be lifted into the joy and the strength of the Lord. You can be ministered to when you serve and minister others. Let's look at the second thing that Jesus knew. That night before he washed their feet, he knew that his disciples were going to fail him, betray him, and abandon him. He knew that Judas would betray him for 30 pieces of silver. He knew that the disciples would fall asleep in the garden when he asked them to stay awake and pray with him. He knew that the disciples were all going to abandon him when the Romans came. He knew that uh, Peter was going to deny him three times, all of that within just the next short period of time. And yet, look, look at what we read in the second half of the first verse. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them despite knowing how they were going to treat him in just the next 24 hours. Jesus spent his whole life dealing with people, if you will, who didn't deserve it. People who were going to uh, reject him, people who were going to misrepresent him and slander him and turn on him. And do you know what, my friends? We're going to be called to serve those same kind of people. I used to get a little bit bitter when I used to try and help people as a pastor, especially uh, when, I, when I was working with young people a lot. And I would try and help them, and then they would, like, turn on me. Or they would just, like, you know, go overboard, do something stupid. And I'd think, man, you punk. <laughs> Can't you see what people are trying to do for you? Can't you appreciate everything that's been given you and everything that's been invested in you? Can't you just have a little backbone and do your part? You know, kind of like, but then the more I studied Jesus and I saw that his approach was very different. And that he knew people were going to fail him but served him anyway. And so then I changed. And when somebody would do that, would react wrong or turn on me, instead of being bitter, I would think to myself, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to become conformed to the image of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Can you remember that? The next time somebody doesn't pay you back what they owe you, the next time somebody gossips behind your back that you befriended, the next time somebody stabs you in the back at work, 
Can you just think, you know, I'm looking at the big picture, and so I'm going to say, Jesus, can you say this? Jesus, thank you for giving me this opportunity to be conformed to your image. What's the third thing Jesus knew? He knew who he was. He knew the big picture. He knew the whole scene. John 3, verse 3. And Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God. What did Jesus know? He knew that the Father had given him all things, and he was going back to God. He'd come from God. He knew he was God's only son. He knew that all the angels of heaven worshipped him. He knew that all of creation belonged to him. He knew that he had been at the right hand of the Father, and he was returning to the right hand of the Father. He knew all that, and yet, in just a few moments, he was going to do a very lowly act of service. Picture Jesus that day, seated there, tired after a very hard day of ministry. Everybody wanted a piece of Jesus, hungry, and his mind is occupied with the things that are going to happen in the next 24 hours. His mind is full. And then it happened. He noticed that no one had washed the disciples' feet. And this was traditional because walking on those dirty streets where all the animals had been going up and down, it was filthy, and so it was traditional to wash someone's feet when they came to eat. And so maybe he sat there for a minute and watched, hoping that one of the disciples, one of the people that he had spent three years with training, would get up and wash their brother's feet. But no one moved. You see, maybe they thought it was beneath them. Maybe they thought, that's someone else's job. That's a servant's job. My job is much more. The things I do are more important. I preach to crowds. I get sent out on missions by Jesus. I pray for the sick and they recover. Now, they all thought it was maybe something somebody else should do. But you see, Jesus was different. It's easy to think that we are too busy to help, that, that we're called to do more important things. But what do we read about Jesus, verse 4 and 5? But Jesus got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he took off his garments because it was going to be a very dirty job. And he, washed, he poured water in a basin, and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Now, he got up, he washed their feet. This was more than a kind act. It wasn't an act at all. It wasn't just something he did to illustrate a point. It was an expression of who he was. But more than just being an expression of who he was, it was an expression of whom we could be, an expression of who we should be. We go forward a few verses to verse 12. So when he had washed their feet, he put his garments back on and sat back at the table. He said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord. And you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, washed your feet, you ought to also wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you should do as I did. You see, our calling is to be like Jesus. And Jesus washed their feet. He served them. He said, you call me teacher and Lord. If Jesus is our teacher and Lord then we have to be willing to follow him and do what he said and serve other people. Uh, Jesus said something very important in John 10, 10. How many of you guys want the good life? How many of you guys would like a better life than what you have now? How many of you would like the life that God could give you? Jesus said he came for that very reason, John 10, 10. He says the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy. That's the devil. But I came so that they might have life, and they might have it in all its abundance, in all its abundance. He said, the reason I came is so that people could have the abundant life, the life of abundance. 
Now, Jesus didn't just come to die on a cross. He came that we should have the abundant life, but he didn't just come to die on a cross. He also came to teach us, and he came to be our example that we should follow. And so if we want the abundant life, we have to do more than just accept the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for our sin. We also have to follow his teaching and follow his example if we're to have the life that we want. Do you want to know Jesus? Do you want to have deep fellowship with him? Because Jesus, in 2020, Jesus walks here. He walks among us. He walks on the earth. But remember, he is here as one who serves. So when you serve, you join him. When you serve, you become his partner. And when you serve, your eyes will be opened and you will see Jesus all around you. Now, I know I'm talking to a lot of people that could give a big amen because they're servants, and they know that's true. The greatest people you know personally all have one thing in common. I'm not talking about people that you admire from afar, you know, some great sports uh, you know, personality, but the people that you respect the most, the people that you think are the greatest, that you know that you would like to be like, they all have one thing in common. They have all discovered the joy and the power of serving. They're all servants, and that's why you respect them. Many years ago, I, maybe 25 years ago, I heard a proverb, <clears throat> and it stuck with me. I've never forgotten it. And here's the proverb. It's called, if you want to be happy. If you want to be happy for an hour, take a nap. If you want to be happy for a day, go fishing. If you want to be happy for a month, now don't shoot me, I didn't make this up. If you want to be happy for a month, get married. <laughs> if you want to be happy for a year, inherit a fortune. But if you want to be happy for the rest of your life, learn to serve and give yourself and love people. How many believe that's true? From 17 to 22, I woke up every day with the same question in my mind. And that question was, what will make me happy today? What do I want to do? What, what, how do I want to plan my life so that six weeks from now, I'll be doing things that make me happy? Every day, the whole intent of my life was to be happy. And by the time I reached my 23rd per birthday, I was not happy. I was very, very miserable. Then several months after my 23rd birthday, I got saved and I got introduced to Jesus as my example. Jesus, who said it's better to give than receive. Jesus, who said I'm among you as one who served. And I began to serve and I discovered the abundant life. You see, serving is a lifestyle that leads to the abundant life. Serving others, having a servant's attitude, it leads to joy. Now, when it comes to being willing to serve, some of us pastors have a saying, at least I do, and that is this. The church is full of willing people. Some are willing to serve, and others are willing to let them. Now, I would say in our church, the people that serve greatly outnumber the people who watch uh, people serve. You know, you think about just on a Sunday morning. I don't know if you, you know, a lot of you guys do serve here on Sunday, but just to put on the typical Sunday service, how many, really several hundred people have to serve for church to happen here? All our outreaches, all our ministries, everything we do here and around the world because people serve. Right now we have, uh, I don't know, around 50 home groups taking place, something like that, watching online because they have hosts that serve because they have home fellowship pastors that serve service is the lifeblood of anything now we have something that you we see we show i don't know every couple of months or once a month i don't know how often exactly around there every six weeks maybe we have what we call serve videos and in those videos we show a particular ministry a ministry that needs help that you could get involved in. 
And uh, I think we had one recently on the bus ministry and different ones. And when you watch these videos, you see people serving. They're being interviewed. You hear about the joy they have in their job, in their service. And uh, you, you hear about the fruit that they're getting. And you get to meet the people that they're serving. And people get excited. And uh, volunteers to those ministries that we showed in the video just skyrocket through the roof. Why? Because in just five minutes, they got a picture of the joy of serving. Now, in the months to come, you'll see a number of videos like that. A number, you'll, you'll find a different opportunities that you could serve here through the church, for instance. So why don't you begin to pray and say, God, show me where I can serve. If you're not already, show me where I can serve. I want that abundant life that comes through serving with Jesus, taking care of the needs of others. So God, show me how I can help. Now, there's a famous saying, perhaps you've come across it. Um, it's attributed often to uh, Churchill, but no one really knows who said it the first time. But here it is. You probably heard it before. It's that you make a living by what you earn, but you make a living, but but you make a life by what you give. Should we see if I can do it without screwing up? You make a. It's just a personal challenge. If I can get the sentence out correctly, you make a living by what you earn but you make a life by what you give. A lot to think about there, isn't it? It's really true. Now, I just want to give a warning about serving, though. You must be prepared for the fact that when you serve people, they will not always respond the way that you want. And many times, it'll be disappointing. If you look to people for your reward in serving them. In other words, you, you're going to look for their gratitude and you're going to look for the fact that they make all the right decisions after you help them. If you, look, if you do that, you're going to be a very disappointed person. You see, that's not why we serve. You don't serve people because they're going to be grateful. You serve people because in so doing, you please Jesus Christ. And when you please Jesus Christ, you feel his pleasure in your life. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. He says, that's just what I would have done. You see, pleasing Christ and feeling his approval, that's the reward that we seek, knowing that we please Jesus. No matter how anybody responds or how anybody turns, if you do the right thing and you serve and it turns out, it's just like, like what was the point? Here's the point. When you serve, Jesus said, I appreciate that. You brought joy to the Lord by your service. I'll tell you, in serving confused and hurting people as a pastor, I have been physically threatened on a number of occasions. I had someone spit in my face. I had to, uh, I had to clean you know, excrement off the floor, wash it off the walls. We had our church vandalized. Um, I've had my house shot at. I've had my tires slashed. Just because I was trying to help people. Not because I did anything bad to anybody. Somebody didn't like the way I was trying to help somebody else. Uh, we've had a uh, number of, of uh, pastors on the staff have been falsely accused of things. Uh, this church, if you've been here for a while, you know that we have been pilloried and falsely reported in newspapers and television. And you know what? I wouldn't change a thing. It is a great privilege to serve in Jesus' name, isn't it? It's a great privilege to serve hurting, confused people that sometimes respond wrong. I wouldn't change a thing. In this present time, we're going to have a lot of opportunities to serve. In these days that we're living right now, when there's so much going on regarding the coronavirus, there is great opportunities to serve you know people that are really afraid. There's a, lot of, there's, a certain, there's a lot of people in the population that get fearful about a lot of things. And you can reach out to them. And you can touch them with your love. And you can say, can I pray for you? Here's what I've learned. I've learned that people, even people that never go to church and haven't been to church in decades, when they're under stress, they want you to pray for them. 
So you can pray for them. You can demonstrate to them the peace that's in a life, the confidence that a person has who has given their life to Jesus Christ and who trusts in God. You know, the schools are, are closing, so next week they'll be closed, starting Monday. And uh, that's going to be a nightmare for a lot of parents. So there's maybe parents that you could help. Maybe you could offer some child care. Maybe if the kids are old enough to stay home without child care, you could just say, you know what, I'll bring them lunch and I'll check in on them. I'll make sure they're not burning down your house. There's a lot of different ways you can serve families right now when everything is being changed. I mean, people can't stay home from work. What are they going to do? Well, ask the Lord. He'll show you. Uh, there's a lot of um, people that are going to be out of work. Some already are laid off. More will happen. I mean, stuff is being shut down, the hotel industry. The, you know, there's at least going to be a period of time. So maybe there's people you can help, you can bring a meal to. Uh, maybe there's some people you could, are going to be able to help in practical ways. Businesses are going to be hurting. There's going to be great opportunities for us to show the confidence we have, even in difficult times, to show the love in our heart that even if we're being stressed, we still have extra to share and give to others. If there's anything big that comes up, you know, in the future that we need to do as a church, we'll let you know. I know you guys will be the first ones there to step up and, and help in a crisis. But you're going to have neighbors, you're going to have friends, you're going to have people that you can serve. I'd like to uh, close us in a prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that, Lord, you told us so many times, do not be afraid. Lord, you said, don't you know your Heavenly Father knows what you need? Our faith is completely grounded in you. We want to thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be the light of the world. That, Lord, you have made us light. You have made us salt. That, Lord, you are with us and you have anointed us, Lord, so that we can even go into difficult situations. And Lord, you'll empower us. You'll anoint us. Lord, we'll see you do wonderful things before our eyes. And so, Lord, we're just asking, Lord, here we are. Lord, we're like you. We want to be like you. Lord, we want to do you proud. We want the church to shine. We want people to glorify Jesus Christ because of what we're going through. And so, Lord, strengthen each and every person and strengthen this church, Lord, as we go through this challenge, uh, Lord, of not even being able to meet. Give us the wisdom to know what to do in the times going forward. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.